Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Annie Sparrow, who is a clinician and professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, also very well known for having worked in many of the world's most devastating combat zones. We're talking about the earthquake, Dr. Sparrow. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you, Diane. So we've talked about the rescue efforts with this devastating earthquake in Turkey. I, from what I've heard about 15% or so of the victims have been in Syria, nearby Syria. You've written about the humanitarian crisis on the other side of the border. Give us a sense of really what's the picture right now. Thanks for having me, Diane. It's very clear when we look at it from here, of course, we can see this picture where dozens of countries have provided masses of aid to Turkey and are there operating, providing relief teams, search and rescue efforts, sensors, dogs, logistics, capacity, pretty much everything that is needed. And that's important because Turkey has suffered a devastating uh, event, of course, but so many apartment buildings have simply collapsed across East Southern Turkey. And then we see Syria and in Northwest Syria, which is a uh, home to 4.5 million Syrians. And they just packed into this tiny area, which is 4% uh, of the country. And of those 4.5 million, 2 million of them were, were already living in what we call camps of last resort. So they're incredibly vulnerable and, we, and there's no one there to help them. For the first uh, three days, nothing went across the border except dead bodies being returned from Turkey into Syria so they could be buried at home. And the UN uh, convoys that did actually reach Turkey, Syria on Thursday and Friday had nothing useful there to help the search and rescue efforts. There was no fuel, there was no spare parts for the digging equipment, there was no earth moving machinery. You know, there was nothing there that actually helped them ship the rubble, get to the victims. People were like clawing away at the, at the rubble with their hands trying to find people. So it's not surprising we see this uh, actually relatively high number, uh, well over 2,000 uh, Syrians that have died in Northwest Syria and then there's several hundred that have died in government controlled areas. And then there are about 3,000 more Syrians that died within Turkey. Well, uh, the you, you, huge discrepancy is just between the, uh, that Syrians have been left on their own and in Turkey, they have been assisted by this massive, and, and that's a great thing, uh, and that, that it has generated this massive international response. But we need to see that in Syria as well. Well, how much of this comes down to, I mean, obviously we've got the politics. We have uh, President, you know, Bashar al-Assad. I mean, is is there the same uh, welcoming of international efforts? Because typically I think there has been some resistance on the part of Syria because of, frankly, the politics that went on before this happened. What are we Well, seeing? we see that, don't we? In that if, if Assad actually cared about the humanitarian situation of uh, his citizens, of Syrian citizens, then he should have opened the border last Monday. I mean, this is an area, this is like the last holdout after 10 years where we've seen every other population in Aleppo, in Eastern Ghouta, like fall, and then all of these populations have then shifted into this remaining area of Idlib and Aleppo. If he had cared, then he could have opened up the borders last Monday, last Tuesday, and, and yet, you know, to do it now, uh, you know, after all hope of finding any survivors is just lost, um, then it's, it's a fairly clear that it is a political calculus rather than a humanitarian calculus. So, you know, and also given that it is a three-month uh, initiative, it's reversible, it's, uh, it doesn't actually help us a lot in the long term when we're thinking about not just the immediate needs, but how to actually help this population uh, build some recovery, some resilience going forward. So it's a pretty hollow you know, move. And not, not that we shouldn't make the most of it. And I think that's a, a very important thing here. We should now, like all the countries that are now in Turkey providing relief are all positioned to now go into, to, into Syria and to provide that same relief. Uh, the US, you know, across all you know, of the military has extraordinary uh, capacity to help on so many levels, from the logistics to the supply chains to the hospital ships. Um, you know, countries across the world have 
masses of reserves of tents, of water treatment, of uh, you know prefabricated buildings, of the fuel. I mean, of all the things that you need that are not typically part of the humanitarian response that's ongoing. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here, and we've seen Assad exploit that opportunity already. Uh, to look like he is doing the humanitarian thing, oh. but it's also up to countries to seize this opportunity to now uh, say, "Come on, you know, earthquakes trumps, uh, you know, trumps a border, uh, which, which if we let it remain closed, and we've seen this, means masses of loss of human life." Well, one of the things that you must know from your own experience, of course, is this, the, the area you mentioned is partially government controlled, partially not. So obviously that it's in the throes of, of a civil war and part of this international conflict. One of the hesitations that I'm sure a lot of countries have is to be giving money that may go to the regime as opposed to the people in need. What, what are you seeing at this point? I mean, really, is there sufficient access that it's through UN channels that people should be donating? Or, or what's likely to have the most traction in terms of achieving results for people in that area? At this stage, governments really need to go ahead and start doing this because, as you point out, it's actually very hard for people like ourselves to donate directly. We can donate and we should to groups like the White Helmets, who are the this extraordinary group of you know, volunteers that have expertise in uh, pulling civilians from the rubble. And there are others like Violet, like Molham, like the Syrian American Medical Services. But, um, you know, for years we've been fed this narrative that, oh, they're all terrorists, we can't, you know, can't, uh, you're not allowed to help them. And this myth that um, the sanctions are responsible for for these uh, abhorrent sort of living conditions. And, you know, this is just nonsense. It's really quite important to, to understand that sanctions have got nothing to do with these uh, hideous conditions in which Assad keeps politically unsympathetic or hostile areas of his population. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing to do with that. And what is even worse is that he has managed to uh, you know, get over the sanctions that have been imposed quite rightly because of the horrific human rights violations that he's visited on his population and by repurposing it and by taking control. So, you know, the problem. there are two problems. Part of the problem is that the UN has adopted this very narrow interpretation of its powers and way back in 2013 was very unwilling for uh, any UN agency or indeed any agency to provide cross-border aid mm -hmm. unless the country permitted or, or unless there was a Security Council resolution. Now that is has never been the case beforehand and you know, this is the whole point of the humanitarian imperative that we provide aid. Uh, however, we do so. We recognise sovereignty, but there comes a point when, if a government is not able or not willing to provide aid and to protect its citizens, and this is what the Security Council resolutions of 2014 showed us, that then you have to have, uh, then you have to be able to go forward directly. But. The, the depending on a Security Council resolution doesn't get us very far. I mean, think about it. If we're only going to invest in another two, uh, or if, if all we want is another two additional border crossings for a few months, mm -hmm. then that in no way you know, helps us meet the massive scale. So it's like all border crossings should be open. We should be able to get in there every which way we can. We need to get in by air, by sea, by land to provide whatever is needed as fast as possible. You know, the earthquake showed us you need speed and you need scale. And therefore, at this stage, it should be absolutely obvious that we cannot allow uh, our humanitarian response to be held hostage by Russia's position on the Security Council because it simply doesn't uh, want, and neither does Assad. There is no interest in helping these incredibly vulnerable uh, parts of its population. Well, it, it's, you raise a good point because we have seen, um, you know, Russia step up, certainly, for Syria. We've also seen Egypt, um, you know, I believe Saudi Arabia, some other players come into 
force here from from this and from your previous experience do these humanitarian crises do they tend to sort of reinforce the alliances that are already in place or is this an opportunity is Assad seeing this as an opportunity to you know shift his own um, brand for the international community because you know he's clearly want Syria to re-engage in some way. I don't know if you feel he's using this crisis in ways that could cause humanitarian strife down the road. Absolutely. And it could not be clearer, could it, that this is the crisis that we are seeing now with the earthquake is the result of the type of policies of repression and the ability for the UN Security Council to be held hostage by Russia, which exercises its veto power, as uh, and combined with uh, Assad's refusal to let the border be fully open. Now, if he had wanted to respond in a humanitarian way, he would have opened up the borders fully. And there are five border crossings into northwestern Syria from Turkey alone. And of course, there are several other countries bordering which enable access. Um, he would have done that last Monday. This is a political calculus. We were heading towards a Security Council vote, looking for another resolution to expand the single border crossing to uh, include one or two others. Now, that in itself is a really limited response, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we sort of stuck on these uh, one or two additional border crossings and uh, getting beyond a renewal period of six months and, and yet we need to have our ability to respond maximally, flexibly. I mean, emergencies like earthquakes, they don't, you can't respond to them uh, in this very, very narrow way. And at the same time, we see um, Assad try to look like a responsible leader where he's now opened up the borders under intense pressure. And at the same time for Russia, it avoids a showdown at the Security Council because no longer we don't and we don't need to go to the Security Council anymore to look for another resolution. So it can concentrate on Ukraine. At the same time, it's only for three months, Diane. Yeah. And so not much can really be done in three months. And uh, Russia still gets to try and curtail the whole cross border response again in July. And and what we need is actually to stay enough already. This is a nonsense way to respond. You know, earthquakes are. Uh, uh, you know, global, affect us globally, but we have to be able to respond uh, collectively and in a way that recognizes that this this massive loss of human life or human life vulnerability trumps borders. Very much so. Yeah. You know, one, one last question, Dr. Sparrow, which is really, you know, are there any lessons from this and how we can, how we need to shift our approach to these sorts of humanitarian crises? I mean, much of this feels like it's out of our control, but um, in terms of what is within our control, what can we take away from this? Because these politically stressed areas um, also often tend to be areas that are, you know, natural disaster zones. Yes, and and certainly, I mean, this earthquake happened in uh, in a very dense area in Turkey, in southern Turkey, where you see it's it's full of uh, high-rise apartment buildings. And then you see in, in across Syria, then people are living in camps. And so in a fairly obscene way, you know, people were saying that Syrians even had a survival advantage because they weren't at risk of having these massive apartment buildings collapse on them. Moving forward, what we what we're seeing now is the same old, same old argument about cross border, cross line, as in convoys from Damascus uh, to two opposition held areas and these have never worked mm. that's why we have a cross-border resolution enabling us to give aid and and we also have at the same time uh, all these countries and the us too of course already providing aid in turkey turkey is willing for us for, for countries to provide aid to northwest syria directly there's no impetus on governments to uh, adhere to a security council resolution the borders are open uh, many countries have already provided aid directly, including Spain, including Saudi. Now, what we need here is to say, let's do it for ourselves. I mean, everyone is, the concern is 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 great to see. And this this type of massive earthquake offers a moment for us to mobilize our, not only our physical resources and our logistical capacity, but our human infrastructure. 
and enables us to reconnect and think, well, let's go it. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's start providing aid in the only manner in which is sustainable moving forward. Because we cannot be hung up on these, you know, these petty laws which are artificial in making, which then restrict our ability to actually respond to to now and coming shocks. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure more to come and um, you know, appreciate the work that you're doing in this area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.